and living up to that introduction, but thank you for giving it. Thank you, my I'm friend. I'm very, very pleased and honored to be here to talk to you about what I think is the greatest advance for civil rights for people with disabilities, literally since the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we're going to spend some time today talking about supported decision making. I want to say a couple of things at the outset though, before we even begin, because if you've heard about uh, SDM, as I'm going to call it, you've heard about it probably as an alternative to guardianship, something people can do instead of getting put in the guardianship, something people can do to emerge from a guardianship, uh, and that's true. But the first thing I want to say is that supported decision making is so much more than that, and I hope you're going to learn that today. It's going to be a way, it is proving to be a way to make people's lives better. So that is my first of two promises before we begin. The first promise is that I'm going to keep an open mind with regard to what SDM can do and what it can't do. I never tell people what to do. I never tell people that guardianship is wrong or evil. If you've recommended it, you did the wrong thing. What I tell people is that this is a piece of information that you can put into your toolbox in the way that you as a healthcare professional work with the people that you uh, you take care of, the way you as a, a human being, as a community member, as a family member can work with people to make their lives better. Second promise I have for you, everything I tell you today, every conclusion I give you, every reference I make is going to be backed by science. The things that we talk about are not some kind of vaporware, aren't the, we really should do this to make the world a better place. No, what I'm telling you is backed by up to 40 years of science. And that is a way that we can improve the lives and the quality of care that people with disabilities receive. So let's begin. And I, I wanna begin with uh, moving my slide, um, which is not currently advancing. Um, any thoughts on that, Dr. Cottrell? Well, we have a um, a gray block in front of it, so I'm wondering. Can you see uh, my title card, supported decision making, etc.? We can see the top and bottom of it, but then the gray box is right in the middle. I wonder so, if. Oh, ah, there we go. Whatever. Okay. Great. Great. Moving forward. Sorry for the tech error. Um, as I said earlier, I only make mistakes with tech on days that end in Y. Uh, as we begin today, I want to focus on, like I said, the Americans with Disabilities Act, because it is a landmark piece of legislation. But at the same time, it only says things that you already know. Looking at your screen, the basic part of the ADA says that just having a disability does not change your right to take part in all parts of society. Now, that is not rocket science. We have been taught since grade school that ever since the Declaration of Independence, people have the full and equal right to be part of, of our communities, that they have the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But it still took until 1990 for America to formally recognize that people with disabilities have the same rights as everyone else, the same options. When it comes to healthcare, the same choices and abilities to be full and equal participants in their healthcare. But the problem is something that we know um, from a study is that people with disabilities often are under or over treated. They receive too much medication or not enough. They receive the worst consistently quality of medical care than any other cohort that we know of. And that is concerning because that necessarily keeps us separate. So as we think about ways to improve the quality of health care, I wanna take you back to the ADA which says that we all have equal rights and take you back to the Declaration of Independence that says we're all created equal. And I want you to think about your rights. Think about the rights that are the most important to you. The ones that you never actually think about because you just know you have them, like freedom of speech, like elections, like the right to go to the worship as you choose or not to worship if you so choose. Think about what all of your rights have in common. They all have choice in common. Every right we have comes down to choice. There's a great quote on your screen from John Paul Sartre, who said, I am my choices. We are all the sum total of the choices that we make. And that's what rights are. The right to freedom of speech is the right to choose what to say and what not to say. Elections are the right to choose who are going to govern us. Everything we have, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the right to choose the life we lead, the happiness we pursue, and the liberty 
we exercise. So I'm here to tell you, in my opinion, the most important right we have is the right to make choices, to exercise that simple life control. Scientifically, we call that self-determination. It's another phrase people without disabilities never think about. Self-determination is the fancy way of saying making choices. When we are self-determined, we are causal actors in our lives. We do things instead of having things done to us. We make things happen. Here's what we know from 40 years of studies. For people with disabilities across the board, those with more self-determination, those who make more choices have better lives. We have study after study after study that say the people with disabilities with more self-determination are more likely to be independent, employed, live in their communities, healthier and safer. That's a problem too, because for 1500 years, we have made cultural assumptions about people with disabilities. I am a lawyer, please don't hate me. I am a bit of a legal geek. So I can tell you that the first time we put laws together in the Western world, the Eastern world has its feet by thousands of years, but in the Western world, an emperor named Justinian created the Justinian Code, where for the first time, the Western world codified its laws. One of those laws, 1500 years ago, said if you are feeble-minded, their words, you had to have a curator put over you. And just like that, 1500 years ago, we created the cultural assumption that people with disabilities who are limited in any way need people to do things for them. We got most of our laws from Great Britain and in feudal Britain in the Middle Ages, they updated the Justinian Code. They said, if you're an idiot or a lunatic, you have to have people called committees decide how to run your life. And just like that, we made that decision that limitations equals inability. And that's essentially what guardianship is. Now, remember, I am not here to say there should never be guardianships. What I am concerned about are what I call overbroad and undue guardianships. Guardianships that take away more rights than people need. Because guardianship works this way. In West Virginia and every other state, a judge decides whether or not a person can exercise his or her rights. And what that judge is supposed to do is decide which rights the person is unable to exercise, if any. And only those rights should be transferred to that person's guardian or conservator, depending upon how you want to refer to it. But what we know from study after study after study are two things. Number one, the vast majority of guardianships take away all rights. They're called plenary or full guardianships, 90% or more based on one study. Second thing we know, healthcare professionals are one of the most common referral sources for guardianship. I've talked to plenty of doctors and healthcare professionals. What they tell me in general is yes, we think a person might not be able to make decisions about their healthcare and they recommend maybe a guardian for that. But what happens inevitably is a person can lose all of their rights. So what I tell people is be careful. Guardianship isn't wrong or evil, but if we recommend it, we should know that statistically likely a person is going to lose all their rights. And as a result, we know from studies like up on your screen that guardians have incredible power over people's lives, going into the most intimate areas of their lives, where they go, who they see, whether they can date, whether they can work, whether they can get health care. There are horrific stories. So we need to be careful. I never say guardianship is bad. I always say, think about it because we know from going on 50 years of studies that when people with disabilities lose their self-determination, their lives get worse. We know back from 1975 study, people with disabilities who had their self-determination, their choices, their exercising of choices removed, but helpless, hopeless, and self-critical. We know from the last couple of decades, they function less well. They, in some cases, live less long. So I always say, be careful with what we recommend. Think, think first about ways to empower or to help people, because here's something else we know that's scary. We live in a time here in 2020, where I think it is fair to say that we have more ways to make more people more independent than ever before. We have supports and services, we have advances in healthcare, we have assistive technology, we have apps. All of you are carrying in your pocket, perhaps looking at them right now, a computer that is more powerful than anything that was on a desk even two decades ago. These phones can connect us with people. They can help us manage our money, manage our time. They can help people help us through scheduling. 
I have one client I worked with has a traumatic brain injury and diabetes. And she's exactly the type of person who would have been in an institution uh, before the ADA because sometimes she doesn't take care of her blood sugar or she forgets to. You know what she has now? A free app, free app that connects to her glucose monitor. So when her sugar gets too low, it texts her, please look after your blood sugar. If it gets lower than that, it texts her doctor, her mother, her sister, so they can intervene. And just like that for free, she's able to live independently and manage her life. But the scary thing is at a time when we have more ways to make more people more independent, as it says on your screen, the number of people under guardianship has tripled just since 1995. In just 25 years, a million more people have gone into guardianship. And we know from studies that 90% of them have lost all of their rights. And some of you may be thinking, well, of course, that makes sense. We're getting older as a country. And that is true. But the study says this, just recently released by the National Council on Disability. The fastest growing population of people going into guardianship are 18-year-olds with intellectual and developmental disabilities. 18-year-olds following that culture where someone says, this person has limitation and tells a parent you should get a guardian. The number three most likely referral source for that is a healthcare professional. Number one are teachers. So people who have a unique place in society to help build people up are with the best of intentions, mind you, in some cases causing them to lose all of their rights because the research is scary. We know from studies that people who lose their self-determination, people in overbroad or undue guardianship, that being in that condition can have a significant negative impact on people's physical and mental health. They feel less well, they function less well. In some cases, they live less long. On the other hand, we know that people with disabilities with more self-determination, who make more choices, have a better quality of life. Study after study says they're more independent, more likely to be employed, more likely to be integrated into their communities. Now, the number one reason I ever hear why a person needs a guardianship is safety. And I never question that. It is every parent, every healthcare professional, every person's obligation to look after people they care about, to make sure people don't get hurt. But I hear it all the time. If my son, my daughter, my patient, my student doesn't have a guardian, something bad might happen. They might get abused. So I point them toward a series of studies by a professor named Professor Ishita Kempka from New York. And she studied uh, frequently the interplay between self-determination and safety. And one of the studies she did is up on your screen. Classic study, control group, experimental group. The control group was told, go live your life. The experimental group, who was a group of people who were similarly situated to the control group. They had similar abilities and limitations. They were given access to a curriculum designed to increase self-determination, to teach them about choices, to teach them about responsibilities. After that curriculum was completed, they brought the groups back together and gave them a recognized study designed to measure a person's ability to recognize abusive situations and avoid abuse. You know what they found? It's on your screen. People who were more self-determined were better able to recognize abuse and better able to avoid it. They were safer. I have told judges across this country, I have told people and lawyers and doctors and teachers across this country, if you want to keep people safe, and we should, we shouldn't be taking away rights. We should be building abilities. Because think about it. This is not rocket science. Aren't you more protective of what you know is yours? If you know something belongs to you, a right, your body, your personal freedom and space, aren't you more likely to protect it? But what we're telling people with disabilities from a young age is the exact opposite of what we tell everyone else. We tell everyone else, stranger danger, don't let people touch you. Don't let a stranger come and take you, resist. People with disabilities, kids with disabilities are told all the time, comply. They're actually graded sometimes or judged in their healthcare fields on how compliant they are. They're poked and they're prodded all the time and told not to question. Aren't we setting them up in some cases to be abused? So not to say that people don't need protection, of course they do, but there are ways to do that that are scientifically more valid than others because we know self-determination is directly correlated with safety. And here is what I call my favorite study, the National Core Indicator Study. And it was done twice in the last decade. National Core Indicator Study was a study on quality of life 
of people with disabilities. And again, it was a, what I call an apples to apple study as a non-scientist. It measured the peoples of similar abilities and limitations, even the old nomenclature, mild disabilities compared to people with mild disabilities, moderate to moderate, severe, severe. The whole point of the study was to see the impact that certain variables had on people's quality of life. And just one of the variables they looked at was whether or not people had a guardian. And this is what was found across the country and including in West Virginia, that across the country and in your state, people of similar abilities and limitations, those that did not have guardians, were more likely to work, live independently, have friends, date and socialize, practice the religion of their choice, have their rights respected, and be more involved in their communities. Isn't this exactly what we want for people? If you are a parent, isn't that exactly what you want for your child? If you are a doctor or a healthcare professional, isn't that exactly what you want for your patient, to have the highest possible quality of life? And if that's true, then what I'm saying is think before we follow 1,500 years of culture and say a person must have a guardian just because they have a disability, or assuming that just because a person has a disability, they cannot play an active role in their health care. So where do we go from here? Well, this is what I suggest. If we know, and we do from 40 years of studies, that people who have more self-determination have a better quality of life, if we know the converse is true, and that people who have less self-determination have a lesser quality of life, then what we have to do is take a next step. Because self-determination is not just saying to people, you're on your own. Go be self-determined. It's not just saying, I'm going to leave you to your own devices. That's not true. Because people with disabilities, older adults, sometimes need help. Well, think about it. We all need help. I can't imagine how much, I can't even tell you how much difficulty I had logging on to this webinar. I needed help. So what we need to do is, is recognize that help is a part of life. And then when it comes to the science, we need to make this conclusion. I hope you agree with me. We need to find ways to maximize people's self-determination because that is directly correlated with quality of life and quality of health, while at the same time making sure that people have access to the supports and services, the help they need to exercise effectively, safely, and appropriately that self-determination. And that's where I can get to the point of today's presentation, supported decision-making. Supported decision-making, in my opinion, again, is the largest and most important advance for civil rights for people with disabilities. And you can see a screenshot on your screen right now of the recognized definition of supported decision-making. If you look at one of the supported decision-making textbooks, you'll find this definition. This definition appears in articles. I can do it from memory. You can read it on your screen. You can screenshot it if you want. I did write it. So you're speaking to the author of that definition. And I hope that as you read it and as you take it in, you will now forget about it because I believe this definition is crap. I do. I think this is overwrought, overwritten, pseudo-intellectual crap that I am guilty of writing. I had a case, I worked with Dr. Blank, who's the primary author for a young woman named Jenny Hatch. It was the first case where we were able to show that supported decision-making can and should be recognized as an alternative to guardianship. And as a result, we had to write a definition for it. I want you to look at it, now. I want you to forget it because this is what supported decision-making is it's on your screen right now. You ask yourself, how do you make decisions? What do you do? If you are a doctor, what do you do when you're not sure of a diagnosis? What do you do when you're not sure how to communicate well with a patient? What do you do if you're doing things outside of your comfort zone, your taxes? You have to figure out what to do with your car. What do you do when you don't know what to do? What you do is you talk to someone who knows. You have someone in your life, I call them go-to people. There's people that you go to who you know know things. My sister is a superintendent of schools. When one of my children has gotten in trouble in school, days ago and in why, I call Jan for advice. I have another sister who is a gerontologist. When we're worried about our mom, we talk to Judy first. There are people in my life I talk to about relationship issues because frankly, I get too close to them to make a decision. When my car has trouble, I have a buddy I call because I don't know anything about cars. That's what supported decision-making is. Supported decision-making is nothing more or less than getting the help you need to do the things you have to do 
and we do it every day. The last time I testified in court, a judge asked me, what is supported decision making? I said, you just did it. You just did it because you asked something you didn't know. So when you think supported decision making, think your screen right now. It's getting help when you need it and we do it every day. But there's a critical, critical difference. If you're a professional, if you're a person without disabilities, if you are someone that society respects when you do it, you're being wise, you're being smart, you're being judicious, you're being a good professional, you're being a good doctor, you're exercising informed choice because you're getting the information you need. You're not going off half cocked, you're not making a snap decision. All of those phrases that we've grown up with that just say, get help and get advice. When you do that, you're smart. When you use supported decision-making, you're smart. If there's a problem for 1500 years and before that as well, when a person with a disability says, I don't understand, help me, or can you explain that to me? Or can you give that to me in plain English? Or I don't know what you're talking about. Society has assumed that they don't know and they can't know. And that, as I submit to you, has led to the surge in guardianship because we assume that limitation equals inability. We assume that the need for help equals the need for a substitute. And I submit only people with disabilities and older adults are subjected to that. When you as doctors and healthcare professionals ask advice, you're doing the smart thing. And here's what we know about self-determination. There is an emerging body of research, including studies going on right now, that is saying exactly what's on your screen. When people with disabilities use self-determination to make their own decisions, to have more self-determination, they have a better quality of life. They make more decisions, they do more things. And again, I submit to you that's not rocket science. Because if we know that self-determination equals the key to quality of life, and we do, then using supported decision-making to make your own decisions is necessarily going to lead to enhances in self-determination. Now let's think about that in ways that are important to doctors and healthcare professionals, because I present to doctors and healthcare professionals often. And the number one thing I hear from them is something along the lines of, well, people with disabilities or worse, they cannot give informed consent. And we cannot perform a procedure or provide medical care to someone who cannot give informed consent. And by the way, I agree. If a person truly is incapable of giving informed consent, that person should not be making medical decisions. That's why I tell you there is nothing wrong with guardianship when it's appropriate. But we have to think about what informed consent really means, because I think people with disabilities are subjected to a different definition of informed consent. So I always call upon the American Medical Association, their board, their code of ethics, talks about what the heart of informed consent is. And that's this. Healthcare professional gives information to the person and the person has to understand it. The person has to consider that information and make a decision and communicate that decision to the doctor who has to understand that. That's all informed consent is. Informed consent isn't necessarily understanding every word or everything. It's understanding enough to make an informed decision and communicate it. You want an example of what I mean? When I go to the doctor and I'm not feeling well and I kiss the doctor's ring and say, please make me feel better. And the doctor writes me a prescription and I say, thank you. And I take it. I have informed consent. I understood the recommendation. I went with it. I have no idea what is in a pack. I have no idea the difference between azithromycin and erythromycin. And I'm not taking the time to read the tiny words telling me what the possible side effects are. So if you have to understand every last thing to give informed consent, none of us do. So think about it this way. Every step in the informed consent process is an opportunity for supported decision making. If a person so chooses, the doctor can explain things to the person and a person's supporter, a trusted friend from a member, someone else they trust can help that person understand by maybe breaking it down into component parts. By maybe I have a, a person who's, who's a great uh, descriptor of this. He's a supporter for his sister. She has intellectual disabilities. And when the doctor said, we want to give you an electrocardiogram, she didn't understand. But Bob said, he said to her, do you remember last year when they gave you that test for your heart and they put those electrodes in parts of your chest and they measured how well your heart was beating? Remember that? She said, yes. 
did they'd like to do that again? Is that okay with you? And she said, yes. Her supporter, Bob, her chosen supporter, explained the doctor's recommendation, helped her understand, and then helped her understand the parameters of her decision, what the pros and what the cons were, what it was, what it meant, so that she could make her decision. And then she could communicate it to the doctor and the doctor could understand it. So the, together, the three of them formed a supported decision-making team at her choice, each step in the informed consent process being supported decision-making. Now think about the impact of that. If you use supported decision-making with people who want to use it and can use it, then people who you might otherwise think can't provide informed consent may well be able to then they will be the primary drivers of their health care. They will manage their health care. They will communicate with you better than doctors who might otherwise not have good communication with their patients, who might otherwise recommend guardianship or recommend treatment or worry that the person understand it, can know that informed consent was given. And family members, friends who would normally be concerned about a person's health care can be part of the person's health care with the consent and input of the person. And that is what I mean. And the, A, the AMA come out with this, and I, I use this great article from AMA Wire all of the time. It refers to studies and discussions that say this. When we have improved doctor-patient communication, including through supported decision-making, it doesn't say that in the article, but you can extrapolate out. When doctors and patients communicate better, we know from studies that leads to better outcomes for the patient. They're healthier. It leads to better medication and plan compliance from the patient. Your recommendations are accepted and put into practice. And it leads to greater job satisfaction and less burnout for the professional. So by using supported decision-making, by helping people be the most important part of their health care and be part of their health care process, not only are you improving their lives, you're improving your, as a healthcare professional's, job satisfaction. Why? Because it's what she got in this field for in the first place. No one became a doctor to take people's rights away. No one became a nurse or a professional or an assistant or a certified nurse's assistant or a direct care professional or anyone providing health care. No one got into this field because they didn't want people to be healthier and happier. This is a way to make that happen. And maybe that's why it's been endorsed throughout the country by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I am fortunate to be the project director of the National Resource Center on Supported Decision-Making, funded by HHS. Divisions of HHS have funded supported decision-making projects across the country, including two that I'm leading in Kansas and Missouri. The American Bar Association has said that lawyers and professionals need to look at laws to make sure that people aren't being unduly put into guardianship. The National Guardianship Association, a group made up of and by and for guardians. No one is more invested in guardianship than the NGA. Guardianship.org. Their position, try supported decision-making before guardianship. The Autistic self Advocacy Network, the ARC, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, all say empower people because it leads to better results. And here is the good news. If you're asking, how do I make this happen? What's step one? What's step two? What's step three? Where's a book? Where's an app? I have good news for you. I'm someone who's written two books. There is no one way to do it, and there shouldn't be. You already know this, because every person I'm talking to right now makes decisions differently than every other person. There are things that you do well and don't do well, areas where you need help and types of help that you use that are different from everyone else. The same is true of supported decision-making. It is highly individualized. If anyone ever tells you there's only one way to do it, run away. They're wrong. They're trying to sell you something. Because supported decision-making can be everything from a listening ear, from you as a healthcare professional, being sure to explain clearly what a person's options are and what's going on. Every time I go to the doctor, I use some variation of, can you please explain that in plain English? But supported decision-making can also be through documents like powers of attorney or medical advance directives that say specifically, I want this person to help me in this area. I want Jonathan to come to the doctor with me and I'm authorizing Jonathan to do so. Help me understand my medical care. I want Wendy to help me with my finances. I want Justin to help me with my interpersonal relationships. Or we can have even things called micro boards and circles of support. 
which are like personal boards of directors or education teams where they get together and I, as a person with disabilities, talk with them about my life and I receive their input and advice to help me make the best decisions I can. All of these, everything you see on your screen is supported decision-making because all of them involve me as a person with disabilities talking to you as someone I trust to help me understand my situations and choices so that I can consider them and I can make my decision. What we know about supported decision-making is this. And I always call them the three commandments of supported decision-making because there's no one way to do it, but every way that we do it does these three things. They are what I call the paradigms. And it goes like this. If we start with the assumption that everyone has the right to make choices to the maximum of their abilities, and that's easy. That again is the Declaration of Independence. We all have the right to make choices. If we start there, the next step's even easier because the next step goes like this. I can ask you for help. I can ask my doctor for advice. I can ask my, my nurse to explain something to me. I can ask my direct care professional to help me interface with my doctor without you saying the fact that you need help means that you can't do it. And that's even easier because we do that every day. You talk to your colleagues for advice every day. It doesn't mean that you're not a qualified professional. The third step's the easiest. There are as many ways to give and get help as there are people. We should be looking to maximize. First thing you do might not work. Neither might the second. But we can keep trying. Something might work. And if nothing works, guardianship's appropriate. But we shouldn't jump to it. So what are some ways, some strategies we can use? I call it making it happen. Like I said, there's no one way, but there are guidelines. And again, this is common sense. The first thing we should think about is deciding where people need help. We should not assume because a person has a particular condition or a particular diagnosis or even a particular IQ, and I am not a fan of IQ, but we ask questions like, where do people need help? And there's a great tool, I've linked to it on your screen, called the Missouri Stoplight Tool. All the Missouri Stoplight Tool is, is a compendium, a list of everyday situations, managing my money, managing my health care, remembering to take medication in a number of areas of life, interpersonal relationships, work, transportation, and it asks three questions. Can this person do this on his or her own? Does a person need help to do this? Or can a person not even do this with help? That is a way for us to zero in on where people truly need assistance or where people might be able to do things with support. If we do that with a person self-guided and then with a person's family member or friend or supporter or a professional, we can triangulate where the areas of need are, which can take us to the next step. Figure out for those areas where people need support, what kind of support they want. There is a very high probability that person is using supported decision-making, not calling it that, of course, because no one calls it supported decision-making. You don't. When you use supported decision-making, you just call it life. But they don't realize, we don't realize that we're using that phrase. But there is a way to figure out how we're implementing it in our lives. So the odds are, if we're using it in one area of our lives, we are probably using it in others, or we could use it in others. So great resource on your screen called the Supported Decision-Making Brainstorming Guide. Again, it's a guided conversation designed to help us figure out where we're already using support and how we can either use that type of support or adapt it in other areas of life. Because the next step then is to figure out who can provide that support. And there are organizations across West Virginia in every community if a person doesn't have people in their lives, and some people don't, and the, the ABA calls them the unbefriended, we can help them link to organizations. If they're young adults, special education. If they're older, Medicaid waivers, centers for independent living, vocational rehabilitation, uh, specific organizations like the Down syndrome organizations, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, et cetera, et cetera. In West Virginia, you have the DD Council, you have Disability Rights West Virginia, you have the University Center for Excellence on Developmental Disabilities. All of these are organizations that are either able to provide support or provide information or maybe link you to people who can provide support. Because the next step is to when you have, when you know what kind of support a person wants, when you know where they need help, when you know what kind of help they use, and when you know who can help it, the next step is just to put it together. 
to put together a plan, how they do it, when they do it, and how they're going to do it. Resource on your screen called the Setting the Wheels in Motion Guide, written, uh, co-written by me and a good friend of mine who is an advocate, a law student, and a mom of three children with disabilities. And she talks about the way that she implements supported decision making with her children. But at the end of this guide, there are great worksheets that can help you think through these issues. Think through what kind of support the person is getting now. Think through who or who is or could be in their lives, where the person wants support to help you create that individualized plan of action. Just like, by the way, every healthcare professional does create an individualized care plan. Shouldn't this be part of an individualized care plan, given that we know that self-determination is a better quality of life, given that we know that communication in healthcare leads to better quality care? And lastly, if you want, it's not specifically required, but you can put it in writing. There's all kinds of plans out there you can use. There's all kinds of forms. There's all kinds of places that can fit at the National, at the Resource Center site, supporteddecisionmaking.org. There are examples of forms. I'll pause for a second because a lot of what I hear often from doctors is you can't do this because of HIPAA. I've heard from doctors many times. The second objection after informed consent is HIPAA. We can't have a supporter in the room because of HIPAA. It would violate the patient's privacy rights. To which I always say, think about a HIPAA release. Every time I go to the doctor, I have to sign a HIPAA release. And what a HIPAA release says in no uncertain terms is, you, doctor, may not share my information. I am not letting you share my information, except with this person I name at the bottom of the form. Well, after everything I've told you about supported decision-making, isn't supported decision-making at its essence sharing information? I can create then a supported decision-making agreement with my doctor by taking that form and writing on it for the purpose of helping me make decisions as I add that person's name. And just like that, you have a legally viable and acceptable supported decision-making form that resolves any concerns about HIPAA. We can do that through powers of attorney too. I have done powers of attorney or advised on them in several states. And a power of attorney says, as you all know, if I can't do something, I want you to do it for me. Well, we can create a power of attorney that has supported decision making in it. On your screen, for example, I can say, I'm giving you the power to do things, but here's how you're going to do them. You're going to consult with me first, and you're going to talk with me. You're going to get my input, and you won't make a decision, for example, that I don't want you to make. We can put specific decisions. I have written powers of attorney that say you can never consent to electroconvulsive therapy. I never consent to Haldol. I never consent to forced treatment. So we can create supported decision-making and patient self-determination as a part of powers of attorney. We can do that in advanced directives. An advanced directive of power of attorney for healthcare, where we say, if something happens to me, I want you to make my healthcare decisions for me. But we can also say in advance that as I am signing this, I don't need someone to make decisions for me. So I am designating you, the person who will make decisions for me if I can't, to be my supporter during the times that I can. As it says on your screen, when you don't have the power to make decisions for me, you're gonna come to the doctor with me, you're gonna provide support to me to help me understand so I can understand and make my own healthcare decisions. If we add a HIPAA waiver in that, and I authorize my doctor to share information with you pursuant to HIPAA, we've just created a legally enforceable, legally appropriate supported decision-making form that every doctor can use. Last couple of thoughts. I always hear this. What about safety? Safety should be our first concern. I never question anybody who is looking out for safety. But I'll tell you this. Um, nothing is safe, ever. There has never been one study, not a single one, that has ever found that people are inherently safer or better off in guardianship. In fact, there have been some terrifying stories on guardianship abuse uh, in the last year. The Richmond Times-Dispatch ran a series. There have been stories in, in the New Yorker, in the New York Times in the last couple of years. That's not to say guardians or guardianship are bad. I'll also guarantee you that people are being taken advantage of with and without disabilities by people they trust. 
So what we know is that nothing is inherently safe. And we know that people are going to be bad at times. So we can't assume that everything is inherently safer. But here's what we can assume, because it's backed by studies. If we know, as we do, that self-determination is correlated with increased safety, then shouldn't we at least try an option that is associated and correlated with self-determination? That's the position of the National Guardianship Association. At least try. And if we do that, we can change everything. And I'm going to leave you with a cliche, uh, changing the world. Because that's what every doctor gets in this field to do to change one patient's world, to change the culture, to change our health. Well, that's what we do when we use supported decision-making. When we empower someone who would ordinarily have his or her rights taken away, or who would not be listened to, when we empower them to be the central causal agent in their life and receive the associated benefits that come from that, then we've changed the world for that person and for every person that comes after that person. Because let me tell you, it gets easier after you did it first. Dr. Cottrell mentioned a case I had for a young woman named Jenny Hatch. It took a year of litigation, a week of trial at multiple hours to get her case won. The first one I did in DC took a day. There was a case in Indiana that took a hearing with one memo. And there was a case in Kentucky where we just talked about it. And the other side said, you know what, this is what we want to do. Because when we know something is a, appropriate, that it's an option, and that it works and can, and can work, that's how we change 1,500 years of culture, one person at a time, one doctor, one healthcare professional, one nurse, one DSP, one CNA, saying, we can do this differently. We can empower people. We can make people the central part of their healthcare. We can improve their healthcare. We can improve our job satisfaction. And doing that is the way we change the world. And I would be thrilled to do it with you. On your screen, you see my contact information. You can reach me at that email address anytime. If you're looking for resources, um, there is a free journal called the Impact Journal on Supported Decision Making that just came out. It discusses some recent work on supported decision making, some studies, some issues. And if you're looking for ways to make it happen, uh, on Amazon is a book that I've written that discusses supported decision making theory and using supported decision making in people's areas of life. So supported decision making as an alternative to guardianship, but also using it in education and healthcare and money management and all areas of life. But the most important thing you can do if you have any questions, besides asking them now, and I'm very happy to answer them is email. It costs nothing to chat and we need to chat. We need to compare notes. We need to talk about what works and what doesn't, what strategies are effective. And we need to talk about your successes. And yes, we need to talk about your failures and your horror stories because they're gonna happen too. By talking and working together, we will maximize people's authority, maximize people's quality of life. It'd be my honor to do that with you. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. That's a powerful presentation. I, we appreciate that. Um, with that, let me um, go ahead and unmute everyone's line. If you have a question, please let us know. Share some experiences, whatever the case might be. This is Lori Heckenbotham speaking. Can you hear me? I can. I have a question, um, and this, I guess, mostly is for Leslie. Did we record this? Yes, we did. And it'll be archived somewhere we can access it? Yes, ma'am. It'll be on our um, website to take a look at, particularly with contact information and some of the links that um, Jonathan had mentioned. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, this is Nicole. May I ask a question? Sure. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. So what, how do you approach parents who already have the mindset that their children or adult children can't make decisions for themselves? Yeah, I get that a lot. Um, yeah. And I talk to parents a lot. I do a lot of presentations to parents. And they always ask the same question. What do you want for your child? 
And every parent answers it the same way. Everyone. Some variation of, I want my child to be as happy as possible, as safe as possible, as independent as possible. And once I hear that, I can work with it. That's what every parent wants. And I never tell a parent what to do. I don't know their child. So I start there. I'm not telling you what to do with your child. You know best for your child. But let me give you some information that can help you have options, help you think through. Because if we're looking for happiness dependent, we can direct that entirely with self-determination. And we can look at options. I also have other materials. Um, uh, the Missouri Developmental Disabilities Council, which is um, MOD, uh, I believe it's MODDCouncil.org, has some really good, really user friendly material on supported decision making. I'm not just saying that because I wrote it. They were designed <laughs> to help communicate directly with parents. One of the guides, the very first one, is called Do I Have to Get Guardianship? And just as a thought exercise. Uh, and I think of all the parents I've ever spoken with, some are right that their children need guardianship. And I always say I never speak against it. My godson is under guardianship, and thank God my sister is able to be there for him when he needs it. But for those who don't need it, we can do better. And materials like that provide the options that can help people make the best decision. So I do, this is this is Leslie. Katrina, are you on? You provided a very good question on chat and I didn't know if you wanted to. Yes, yes I am. Um, I fought very hard to get a local court to recognize supported decision making. However, the guardian at litem for the individual fought equally hard for full guardianship. Um, the judge in that case finally ruled for a limited guardianship of the individual. The individual wants to regain her rights back and she wants to become her own guardian. Um, she does have a network of individuals that she relies on to help her make decisions. But what will she need to do to convince the judge to let her have her rights back? So one, thank you for that fight. And two, I would be very happy to talk with you offline about strategies. Um, I remember my review of West Virginia law. It's pretty consistent with most others that say any person may challenge the existence of a guardianship to show that he or she has either regained capacity or that guardianship is no longer necessary. So the way that I've helped people challenge guardianships is to do two things. One, to argue that the use of supported decision making, either this person been doing it all along and never lacked capacity, but we never fully considered it, or has empowered a person to have the capacity he or she previously lacked, and that no longer the guardianship is no longer necessary. Two strategies, I think, that make this really effective, and I won't get too in the weeds. Like I said, please email me. I'll be happy to talk. I am a big fan of either the day in the life story or video, um, which is you don't need an expert for necessarily. You just need to document the way the person lives his or her life. How does she work? How does she communicate? What does she do? What are her methods? Who is in her life? And then we create essentially the chart. For these decisions, the person does this. For this, the person does the other. Uh, for a young woman named Susie Heck in Kentucky, we created what we call the dream board that showed her plan and her supporters. And it was a beautiful piece of, of art, actually, but it showed how she directed her supports and services and what she wanted in her life. And with that, we were, they were, I, I barely consulted, able to show that she did not need a guardian. In your particular case, what I like to do um, is remind judges about what the law says. Um, judges are part of our culture, too, and they fall prey to the protectionist attitude as well. But if you look at your law, I'm pretty sure West Virginia law says very clearly, uh, guardianship's only a perfect if there is no other alternative. Well, judge, here is the alternative. And you need clear and convincing evidence for this. And maybe you didn't have this before, but now you have it and as the guardian, so to speak, of the law. This is how we can move forward in compliance with the law. As for the GAL, I'm sorry. I wish that was a rare story. Uh, we had six days of trial in Jenny's case. We had multiple experts. 
The other side had no experts, and the GAL still recommended full guardianship in a group home, segregated group home, with the guardians controlling all access to her. Sometimes people just don't want to hear, and that's why we need good advocates to fight. Any other questions? Thank or you. Thanks, Katrina. Hi, this is Steve Wiseman with the Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, it was a great presentation, very powerful, and uh, had a lot of great resources attached. So I think everybody got a lot from this. I'm so glad you had this, Leslie. Um, in West Virginia, the, uh, the law is not black and white. There is limited guardianship. As a matter of fact, there's a inclination that you should be looking at limited guardianship if you're going to look at guardianship at all. But uh, unfortunately, we learn from people's testimony that it's not applied universally. And um, matter of fact, when even families, it's very uh, true. It's not consistently across the state. We have an issue, and we have a wings group here, and I'm sure you're familiar with those mm -hmm. uh, in West Virginia. And um, we're very concerned about it. We need. Uh, we need to step up, ramp up the enforcement, uh, at least of that of that issue. And it would probably help a lot of people keep from falling down the abyss of uh, full guardianship ideas. I completely, I completely agree. And I believe, Mr. Wiseman, you and I have met or spoken before, but what you said is so true. And and for those who don't know what a WINGS group is, it's, kind of, it's, it's an acronym for a work group of interdisciplinary network on guardianship systems, I believe. What it's supposed to be is led by the judiciary to look at alternatives to guardianship and make sure it happens. I was just looking to see if I had your law in front of me. Um, and I, in reviewing it, again, it, it's not unclear. It's actually pretty clear that guardianship should only be done as a last resort. The key is to get that information out, to make sure that judges understand it. And, and frankly, some judges don't want to apply it. And you have to, you have to apply, you have to go after that frontally and say, this is the law. And to a judge, that's the Bible, to say, this is what we have to do to hold them to their case, to hold them to your proof. I've told judges all the time, if all you've got is a person coming before you saying, she's got Down syndrome, he has got an intellectual disability, that's not enough for a guardianship. You need clear and convincing evidence of what a person can and can't do. So if all it is is an IQ test and a diagnosis, that can't be enough. I've pushed across the country for functional evaluations. Um, you know, Jenny Hatch had a measured IQ of 49. And my expert said, there's no way she can make decisions. And I said, she likes Chick-fil-A, go to lunch, I'll see you in an hour. And he came back and said, oh, she makes decisions. She looked both ways for she crossed the street. She ordered, she paid, she counted her change. She didn't talk to strangers. We had pleasant conversation and she took care of her hygiene needs. In other words, she did all of the things functionally that equal decision-making and directing your life. She needed some support in some areas. So that's what we have to push to a judge and to the people who say that guardianship should be a blanket option. What else are we looking at? I always call that the critical question. What else have you tried? You can't order a guardianship until you answer that question in 95% of cases. Of course, there are people who need a guardian, you know, a person in a coma needs a guardian, a person who is so limited that they can't take part in decision-making based upon reviews needs a guardian. But for the vast majority of us, the question is one of degree. What is that person's limitation and what help does he or she need? And can that help be provided? Um, and I, I'm terrible with names, but the, the, the person who said she fought on a guardianship, the person had a network. That's what we need is to show the networks and show the impact and put it right there and make the argument. And it's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to require a, a, a large amount of banging heads against walls. Sometimes that's the only way to let the light through, and I know it's frustrating. Um, 1,500 years of culture pushes back. But the only way to beat the darkness sometimes is to kick it until it bleeds daylight. And it's on us as advocates 
to do that, to keep pushing. So a DD council is uniquely situated to bring together stakeholders, to put out informational stuff. I'm working with DD councils right now in Virginia and New York and in Ohio, in Kansas and Missouri on statewide supported decision-making projects. That includes not only advocacy and implementation, but educational materials and training for parents and teachers and doctors and judges and attorneys to say, this is what this means. And this is how we can make it happen. And I'm so sorry for soapboxing, but I know I'm preaching to the choir, but this is how we can make the changes that need to be made. Any other questions or comments? Yes, I have a question. Uh, this is Regis Grant with Specialized Family Care. Um, I totally love the um, concept of supported decision making, but with some of our folks, most of us who are in their lives are paid to be in their lives. And what happens with the team uh, when a member has a selfish motive or an agency wants to keep um, that person within their agency? Yeah, um, and I get this question a lot as well, and I have to preface this by saying it's a controversial subject and I am not always in the mainstream on it, but here is my position. Supported decision-making is about self-determination. It's about choice. So if a person chooses or a person has no choice because that person has no one in their life and wants a paid professional to provide support, I believe that's appropriate. I know that there are laws across the country and some pending that say a supporter cannot be someone who is paid. My answer to that is that would mean I could never support Jenny Hatch because I'm on a salary, I'm her lawyer. That would mean everyone I just spoke to, every healthcare professional couldn't assist with supported decision-making because they're paid. So let's start there. We should not say that just because a person is paid, they can never be a supporter. I know people whose closest friends are their personal care attendants. I know people who have set up their Medicaid waivers so that they can hire their closest friends who support them to be their worker. Now, to your specific question, which is about a conflict of interest question, I believe there are ways to create this to make it clear. I think a person, for example, I would never advise Jenny on a matter that would directly benefit me. You know, hey, Jenny, you should sell me this car for a dollar. You know, that's a conflict. I have a direct interest in that. So I think we can write supported decision-making agreements. We can write powers of attorney. And if it comes to that, we can write laws that specifically kind of uh, cordon off supporters from providing supports in areas, as you described, where that person has a motive that gives him or her a conflict of interest. And there are models on that. So if we see what you're afraid, what you're talking about, if we see that kind of abuse and neglect and exploitation, then you're a mandated reporter. We're all on this call, I imagine, mandated reporters. So if we see abuse, neglect, or exploitation, we have areas we can go to. Um, I always get judges asking me that question. I know, again, I'm soapboxing, but they always say, I would always be there. We need this level of support. Who's protecting, again, them? And I say that they, meaning people with disabilities, have the exact same support that I have. If you see me getting abused, neglected, or exploited, you can go to the police, you can go to APS. If they're underage, you can go to CPS. You can go to the Attorney General's Medicaid Fraud Unit if it's on my health care. And people with disabilities have even more protection than I do, because you have a protection and advocacy system. You have a DD council, you have a USED, you have an adult disability resource center, and on and on. So when we see abuse, neglect, or exploitation, we must take steps to stop it. But just because there is a possibility of something bad happening, does not mean that we should not do something that is correlated with very good things. Because if we do it that way, we all have to look in the mirror. If we will only say you can make choices and you can associate with who you associate with, 
if it means you'll never make a bad choice or never will be led astray or never will have someone influence you to do something stupid, then I've got to stop playing poker with my friends because they get me to do really dumb things, especially when we're in Vegas. But it doesn't mean that I don't have the right to associate with them and the right to have them as my supporters. It just means we have to be careful because if you saw them getting me not to do stupid things, but to do actually harmful things, you as a mandated reporter would call APS as exactly you should. The system should work the same way for people with disabilities. Thank you, you answered my question. In a lot more words than you probably wanted. I'm sorry, sir. No, not at all. You sure are passionate. Thank you. It's a, it's a subject that's worth the passion. I hope all of you are as well. Absolutely. So we are at three o'clock. I do want to thank you though for um, spending your time. I know that you were just, I spent a lot of time yesterday having talked to you in the courtroom on the sleepless nights. Um, this is very helpful. I know our DD Council, as Steve had mentioned, has um, taken up this initiative for many years and it's important for us to learn more on our end and um, combine efforts whenever possible to get this get this moving. So um, as others had asked, just again housekeeping, we will post these and all of the valuable resources that Jonathan has mentioned today from his work and his um, books as well as the materials from other um, partners that he's had will be available in those slides. And, and again, thank you so much for your time, Jonathan. It's been my honor. And I just want to reiterate what Dr. Cottrell said. So much of this requires communication and my email is right on your screen. Please use it if you have want to talk or have questions. Thank you so much. We will take care. Thank you. Thank you.